Bow your heads with me, please. Let's pray. You are a marvelous God, and we love you because you have loved us first. Not only have you loved us first, but you have loved us with an everlasting love. And with loving acts of kindness, you keep pulling us to yourself. We ask today that by the power of the Spirit of God, you would open our hearts to hear your word, and then you would help us to live it so that your name alone will be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we spoke about the matter of marriage being a covenant, not a commercial contract. And because it's a covenant, we said that one of the critical things is that we invited God to witness this covenant. Now, as I said last time, it's all right for you to live with a roommate if you're in college or university for three years and you can put up with what they put up with for some time. But when you come to marriage, you have a partner for life. There's no three years and you're out. No. It is a covenant that we make to say until death do us part or until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Yet we find that outside the church and inside the church, there are a number of persons who are getting divorced. It seems as if we do not understand the concept of a covenant. Today I want to talk about, in a sense, if it is possible, how to divorce-proof your marriage. That's what I want to talk about. And so my, my, my topic today is deepening intimacy decreases divorce. Deepening intimacy decreases divorce. Now, you should have a PowerPoint, I think. If we begin, we want to read um, the verse in Genesis. And here's what it says, Genesis 2, verses 18 to 20. It says this. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Jump over to verse 20. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But, you hear the word but again, sir? For Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. And if you go over to verse, it, it, two things comes from this, these, two, these three verses. Is this. The first thing, marriage is God's idea. It is God who said it is not good for man to be alone. Nor woman. Doesn't mean that every single person will be married. Because God has called some to serve him completely. And there are some persons who will not get married. But for those who get married, understand that marriage is God's idea. The second thing to note is that married partners should complement each other. Complement spelled with an E, not an I. What it means is that you are going to work together in all phases of life. And the purpose of working together is to bring glory and honor to God. Let's read verses 23 and 24 of the same chapter 2. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, watch that, consequence. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. What do we get from those verses? This is it. God expects marriage to be an unbroken union, reflecting the union of Christ and the church. God expects marriage to be an unbroken union, reflecting the union of Christ and the church. And when we go over to Ephesians 5, verse 24 and 25, we read these words. Now, as the church sub submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
So what we find there is that God expects marriage to be an unbroken union. But notice marriage pictures Christ's relationship with the church. Therefore we can say an intimate union is less likely to end in divorce. If your union is an intimate one, it's less likely to end in divorce. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to give you five things with regards to that. You see, intimacy requires development in five areas. Many times when we talk about intimacy, we only think about the physical. But if that's what you, you get married for, you're going to have a problem. Because sex can't hold a marriage. A marriage needs much more than that. Intimacy is not just physical. Intimacy comes in five areas. And the first of these is spiritual. If you are going to divorce-proof your marriage, the first thing you have to do is develop spiritual intimacy. Spiritual intimacy grows when we, individually and together, crave and willingly submit to the changing power of God's word. Every single child of God is responsible to make a witness for Jesus in every situation and in every relationship. So when you get married, the goal of your marriage must also be to make a witness for Jesus. Because if you are a child of God, any relationship you are in or any situation you are in must be a situation in which you make a witness for Jesus. You can't leave that out. Because we are first called to be witnesses. Hear what, happens, hear what has happened. God has entrusted to us the gospel, which is the answer to the world's problem. So whatever situation you find yourself in, the gospel must be born by you. So when you get married, one of the things you must remember, marriage is not just about satisfying your physical desires. Marriage is about both of you making a witness for Jesus. This is the reason why it says it is like the union between Christ and the church. So spiritual intimacy grows when we individually and together crave and willingly submit to the changing power of God's word. Listen to the word of God. You see what happened? Spiritual intimacy is possible because of one, both of us are made in the image of God. Because we are made in the image of God, the possibility of communion with God becomes a reality. The animals don't have that. That is why none of them could fit Adam. But you, as a human being, made in the image of God, is able to interact with God. And if it is that you are not growing in your own spiritual life, your marriage is going to have a problem. You have to grow in your spiritual life. As you grow, as both of you grow, as both of you come together for that kind of um, interaction, your devotional time, you are going to grow in the word of God. And hear what it says in First Peter. Both have been bought by the blood of Jesus. So you are able to have the spiritual interaction with God because you have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. God has redeemed you. We celebrated that just now. And the reality is that because you're in God's image, you can have an interaction with God. And I'd want to point out the text in Peter that like newborn babes, we have to continually crave the word of God, which is able to transform us and to make us into people that God wants us to be. If two persons are individually doing that and doing it together, they are going to grow in their spiritual intimacy. Get the point? The second area in which we need to grow is physical intimacy. Physical intimacy is about touch and closeness. It might include holding hands, cuddling, kissing, and sex. And we need to grow in that. And we are able to grow because physical intimacy is possible because we are sexual beings. God has made us sexual beings. And we have to accept the fact that we are. And what else? God gave us sex to enjoy and to reproduce our kind. Be fruitful and multiply, he said. But sex is not an afterthought. Sex is not a bad thing. Unfortunately, for many years, the church didn't teach it right. Unfortunately. But sex is a precious gift from God. And when you read the book of Songs of Solomon, you can't get away from that. 
I mean, it's so graphic. In fact, the rabbis didn't allow anybody under 30 to read the book of Songs of Solomon because it was such a graphic picture of erotic love. Now, listen to what Proverbs says. Proverbs 5, verses 18 to 19. It says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely dear, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always in her love. So we see that what happened is that God expects us to grow in physical intimacy as well as in spiritual intimacy. The third one we find is that if we are going to um, divorce proof, proof our marriage, we need to grow intellectually. Intellectual intimacy is sharing whatever you are thinking. It is engaging in discussion about any topic from Bible to all aspects of everyday life, whether it is politics, what's going on in the country, something about your own skills and your own abilities. So you have to grow intellectually together. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a problem. And why is that? Why are we able to do that? Because intellectual intimacy is possible because we have minds, don't it? Yes, we have minds and we are able to think and then also we have the power of choice and so what happened is that my opinion might not be your opinion even though we are married but by our exchange and interaction we are growing together um, for the purpose of God are you understanding and, and if you can't if you are having a problem relating to your spouse intellectually you're going to have a problem in the marriage because all of us need that kind of intellectual outlet. Whether you engage in playing Scrabble together or you're doing crossword puzzle, there's something about that intellectual challenge that is necessary. And as you grow and develop in that area, you're going to again draw closer to your spouse. Hear what the Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 8. It says, finally, brothers, you know it very well. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The Bible calls us to think, to use our heads and think. And in fact, one of the things the Bible says is that now that you are a Christian, you must retrain the mind, don't it? And so part of the discussions you have with your spouse sometimes is to bring what is in the public arena and put it in light of the word of God and be able to repudiate some of it as you think it through, seeing that those things don't match up with the, the Bible that you, you believe and the, what you use as a, the center of what you do. Now, the fourth thing that we see is recreational intimacy. Recreational intimacy is being active together. It is doing something with your spouse that allows you to actively spend time together. And I find that a lot of people do well when they are dating. But after they get married, they don't plan things together. They don't go places together. They don't take a little drive. You don't have to, you don't have, to have money now to enjoy each other's company. Drive out into the country. Um, if you drive out to Linston and get a good piece of jerk pork or somewhere, it'd have to be, it'd have to be a, a date evening. But it can be various different activities. Go over to Portland and go a little rafting. You, you need to spend time together. I find that a lot of couples don't spend any time together. So they are in a little square and they start to get at each other. But if you are going to grow and di divorce proof in marriage, there must be th these areas that you're growing. Recreational, recreational, recre I'm getting it wrong, right? Recreational intimacy is possible because we have the ability to laugh and enjoy all that God has made. Am I right? All that God has made. And we have the ability to socialize and interact with others. And so, you know, I don't know, maybe you and your, your spouse need to go take a course in ballroom dancing or something. But get involved in some kind of activity that pull you close to one another. And, and hear what Ecclesiastes 9 verse 9 says. It says, enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun all your meaningless days because these are days that are going to pass and then you go to eternity but this is your lot in life 
and in your toilsome labor under the sun. So God expects us with our spouse to enjoy the things that God has given. And let me tell you something. This country, Jamaica, have a lot of beauty spots. There's some bird sanctuary down in West Milan, bird sanctuary over there in, in, in um, St. James. Find the spots. There are some little um, springs and some little falls. This is a beautiful country with a lot of things to do. And I think that many times big tourists come here, come no more than we. So you and your spouse need to find time, plan some days, you go out and just enjoy the activities and the beautiful creation of God. This country is one country, any direction you turn, the beauty will, will catch you. So, so I'm saying if we are going to divorce proof for marriage, recreational intimacy is important. And the fifth one, last one, is emotional intimacy. It's different from intellectual. Emotional intimacy is, sheer, is a sharing of feelings. It builds trust and closeness. It's one thing for me to give you my opinion about something. It's the next thing to tell you how I feel about it. There's a little difference there. Are you understanding? When I was studying back in 1986, I think it was. No, before that. Back in 1981, I was doing a course in um, pastoral counseling. And one of the assignments I had to do was to go on what they call a marriage encounter with my wife. It was a weekend at a hotel where we went through a marriage seminar and then I had to write a report. And in that seminar, one of the things they focus on is expressing your feelings. And to express your feelings, you have to express it in a way that your spouse understands. So you have to have a, a common thread to say, I feel like when we just got married and went on the honeymoon. Yeah, these people still on honeymoon. They'll be on honeymoon for what? Another five years? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm married for 42 years this year and I'm still on honeymoon. So, so the reality is that if you don't take time to make your marriage count, you're going to have a problem. Are you understanding? Now, one of the things that you have to understand real good what feelings are. Feelings are. So if I tell you I feel upset, it's, it, I feel upset. Now, you might not think it is justified, but it's how I feel. Are you understanding? And that's one of the problems we have. We can't accept that the person say, I am feeling this way. You say, oh, you can feel away there. Well, that's how the person feel. Now, you can explore that. You can explore whether um, one way or the other. Some of the ways we feel about things is because we have been cultural to feel that way. So some people say, boy, the picnic shame me. Picnic can't shame you. Picnic is something you don't like. <laughs> but you feel shame. All right, leave that alone. You get the point I'm making? All right, feelings are. Now, emotional intimacy is possible because of two more things. We have the ability to express our feelings. And we have the ability to sympathize and to affirm others. So when somebody is feeling down, somebody is having a hard day, you can sympathize with them. And when you sympathize with them, there's a sense of closeness. So the wife comes and says, boy, today was a hard day at work. Right? And you listen through everything and you are able to sympathize. Somebody comes and says, you know what happened to me at work today? So and so and so. And, so. and you can affirm them. And, and you know how important this is? In Genesis 2 and verse 25, it says, The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Because it's not talking about nudity. It's talking about when you empty your inside. And some of us are afraid to share some of the things on the inside because we don't know people are going to respond. But when you have a spouse and you're able to share on the inside, and you can show that that person is not going to use your weakness against you. And they are going to big you up and support you. Then you draw closer. Because one of the critical things about life, well, we don't get there yet, the way things are going, we don't know, is that I don't have ESP. Maybe you have it already. So unless you tell me what's going on the inside, I won't know. But when I tell you what's going on the inside, I expect that you're going to reach out to me. So here what, we are, here what we have here now. We have Spire, Spire, or am I pronounce S-P-I-R-E. Spiritual intimacy, physical intimacy, intellectual intimacy, recreational intimacy, and emotional intimacy. So it's spell the word Spire. Now, of course, you know that word usually speak to like a steeple on a church building, right? It's uh, the pinnacle where things come together. 
Another word we can use for it is pinnacle. Right? And I have deliberately set those five in that way to spell the word for you. Because you see, a pinnacle speaks to the high point. Am I right? The high point. And so do you want your marriage to reach the highest possible point? Because if you want it to be, then you have to ensure that there is spiritual intimacy. There is physical intimacy. There is intellectual intimacy. There is recreational intimacy. And there is emotional intimacy. And I'm telling you, if two persons are growing in this way, their marriage is going to be solid. It's going to continue to bring many returns after many years. I trust this morning that this would have been useful to you as you listen both online and in the sanctuary. God bless you. Oh, oh, oh.